Hello, I'm Rebecca Livingston. So thrilled to be beaming to Point Piper tonight from the suburbs of Brisbane to you, Malcolm Turnbull. Hello. Hey, great to be with you, Rebecca. Not the book tour you imagined you'd be doing. No, no, it's a virtual book tour. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing. It, um, but you know, it's it's great that we're able to be spatially distanced, but not truthfully socially distanced, thanks to. Uh, the wizardry of uh, technology, Facebook, and your digital manager, Tim. It also means that any number of the characters in your book, A Bigger Picture, may well be tuned in tonight. You never know. Prince Charles, Justin Trudeau, Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. Julia Gillard, Rupert Murdoch. It's why it makes for fascinating reading is all of the juicy anecdotes. Um, for people online, Thank you for being with us this Friday night. Uh, let's call it drinks at Malcolm's house. Um, Malcolm and I are going to chat for about the next 30 minutes or so, and there's loads of good stuff to get through. And then if you've got questions, um, we'd love for you to pop them up on the screen and we'll try and get through a few of those around about half past seven as well. Have you got a drink, Malcolm? I do, I do. I have a, I have a glass of water. I have a glass of wine. And I also have an amazing thing, a bottle of vodka, which I hasten to add I'm not going to drink. In fact, I've had this bottle of vodka for about 25 years, more, actually 26 years, uh, and it was given to me by a Russian politician called Vladimir Zhirinovsky, and I only found it in a cupboard last weekend. And as you can see, I haven't drunk any of it. But it's uh, he. I met with him, and it's all described here in the book when I was doing business with a gold about a gold mine in Russia in the early nineties, just after the Soviet Union fell. And there he is, looking very stern. There, you can see him. Just see him. Yes. There. And it says it says in Russian here, vodka Zhirinovsky. So there you go. Anyway, I think I, I think it's probably been shut. I've uh, been. Um, closed this bottle's been uh, you know closed for so long i think i'll leave it that way and just keep it as a memento well let me assure you that had we been face to face tonight i would have demanded that the bottle was ripped open and we would have done a quick shot of vodka and off we yeah, go yes. i was i was actually wondering if you were having a glass of to make it the caviar and blinis to make yeah, it. Yeah. yeah um there's a there's a line from uh Robert Hughes in the book that stayed with me, uh, a way that he greeted some guests of yours. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. How did uh, he refer to them? But yeah, well, he 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 stood up at the town hall and uh, and he said uh, he said, "Welcome, Chardonnay drinkers." So he was a he was a um, there was a always oh, a Republican rally. Uh, I, hate, I hate to correct you on your own book. He, it wasn't just Chardonnay drinkers. It was. Welcome, Chardonnay Swilling Elitists. Chardonnay Swilling Elitists. Well, you're right. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> um, no, well, Bob, um, uh, the Republican movement was founded in about 1990, and and um, Tom Keneally, the you know the the author and novelist, much beloved of Dimmicks, uh, no doubt. Um, Tom uh, always said that the idea came from a long lunch with Neville Rand over several bottles of uh, Chardonnay. So the our critics always said we were just a bunch of Chardonnay swilling elitists. So that was, Bob just reveled in that. You're quite right. Well, cheers to anyone who's having a drink tonight. When do you think Australia will become a republic? I think we'll become a republic after the end of the Queen's reign. Um, I think that's the next big opportunity. And I mean, I've had that view for over 20 years, actually. Uh, you know, it takes a lot. You need you've got to get you need it. You need the t right timing to get the political momentum for the change. And I think after the Queen's reign comes to an end, that will be a historical watershed of epic proportions. And after that, that will be a time when I think people will say, "Yep, well, it probably is about time we had a look at our constitutional arrangements and this connection with the UK monarchy." Uh, so. Uh, that's yeah, and I and I've, I've got. I can if you'd like me to go on, I can. The, well, I just want to get back to your drinking habits briefly. First of all, all right. actually, that if or when that happens, you may uh, well charge your glass. But yeah. reading through uh, your life story, yeah. you spend a lot of time 
with journalists and lawyers who hate a drink, as you know. I do. Are you uh, journalists, journalists are known as being so abstemious. In fact, they're famous for it. But, but are you much of a drinker? Um, well, I don't think anyone's ever admitted they are. But I, I, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not, certainly not a teetotaler. The, the, uh, I gave a speech once, actually, a Republican speech to a dinner, uh, in fact, many, you know, back in the, uh, would have been in the early 90s, and I think it was, a, it was a dinner, annual dinner of a big trade union. They invited me to come along and speak. And it was a pretty, um, it was a pretty merry evening. And as I was leaving, a young reporter from the ABC sort of doorstopped me just before I got into a taxi and obviously um, uh, said, um, said uh, you know, you've had a very, uh, you've obviously had a very good night, well, you know, words to that effect. And uh, what sort of republic do you favour? And I said, well, obviously I'm not in favour of a, of a teetotal republic and then uh, left. <laughs> Nicely done. Mm. Well, let's hope, given that it's Friday night, glass of wine in hand, uh, hello to Andrew and Cabramatta, Maggie in Wagga. I can see lots of people logging on saying g'day to you, Malcolm Turnbull. Uh -huh. um, so let's tell some good stories. And, in fact, let's start in America. You recount in the book Barack Obama discussing Donald Trump's chances of making it into the White House. What did he say about that? Well, it's, that's, that's sort of, that's a, uh, it was interesting. I was discussing the, uh, this was in the beginning of 2016, and, uh, the you know, this is, the elections obviously was held in November, and so the, the Republicans hadn't chosen their candidate, and, in fact, the Democrats hadn't chosen theirs, although it was pretty obviously going to be Hillary. Um, and so, and we were talking about the election, and uh, Barack said enigmatically, I say in the book, because who knows, who, who can imagine, who, who would he have been referring to? I don't know. He said, don't worry, the American people will never elect a lunatic to sit in this office. So um, that was his. That was the assurance he gave. So, lunatic or not, they elected uh, Donald Trump, and uh, we've been living with the impact of that uh, ever since. What's Donald Trump like when there aren't cameras there? Um, he's a <clears throat> well. He's sort of always on show. He is a he is a big, big person, big personality, and a big person physically. You know, he's very tall. He, not, I would think he's probably six, three or four, and he's he's large physically. Um, so he's got a very imposing physical presence. He is uh, he can be he's very mercurial. He can be very funny. He can get very angry. I had one very angry phone call with him. Uh, but in um, in in the you know one on one, uh, I found him engaging, and actually uh, we got on very well, and and we. We negotiated satisfactorily some quite difficult uh, trade issues, uh, and I have to say he gave me a very good hearing, listened carefully, and uh, <clears throat> and we came to an agreement that we both felt was in our country's respective best interests. So, you know, the, the sort of cr the, the crazy Donald Trump, which is um, you know uh, everyone talks about and writes about, I didn't see that. You do yeah. write though that he has a. I think a thoroughly dystopian perspective. Oh yeah, of the world, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. But, and what I mean by that is that he's got a belief, like he doesn't believe that America can, you know, make the world safe for democracy. He doesn't. He doesn't have. He believes that there are parts of the world where people have been hating and killing each other for hundreds, if not thousands, of years, and there's nothing America can do to change that. And so the best thing America can do is stay out. Of it. That's why he was, you know ferociously against the Iraq war. Um, he is a uh, natural isolationist. Um, he doesn't have that neocon ambition to remake the world, you know, that so many of the people around George W. Bush uh, had. Uh, he's, you know, he's in that sort of protectionist, isolationist tradition. And, th and that's why it's important, you know, when you talk about trade, you know, a lot of I mean, I had, you know, I disagree with Trump on trade, right? And I disagreed with him substantially, and was able to certainly persuade him to um, 
to you know take a different approach to Australia. But but his attitudes on trade are very much in an American tradition. You know, they're not just a uh, idiosyncratic Trumpian point of view. Do you worry? Do you worry about America? About the world? I do. Well, America is the America is the uh, is the indispensable nation, as we often say, and it's incredibly important for us in particular. They they are our big strategic ally, very important, particularly in the re in this region. Um, and I do I worry that America is becoming so divided. So there seems to be um, so much polarization there. It's it's deeply troubling. It's it's heartbreaking and looking at the uh, terrible experience they're having with uh, COVID-19 at the moment. It's anyone that, you know, that, that loves America and loves, you know, the American people. And I think most Australians do have a lot of affection for America. You know, we've got a lot in common with them in terms of values and history. Uh, it's just, it's heartbreaking to watch what's going on there now. How do you think the global power dynamic will change post-pandemic between America, China and others? Well, you know, the world will not be as different post-COVID as people currently think, but it won't be the same either. So I think the there is obviously enormous resentment towards China because that's where the virus originated and plainly the Chinese could have done a better job at confining the virus to begin with. Uh, and there was an element of, of uh, denial whether you want to call it denial, cover up, whatever, uh, mistakes were made. But there have been plenty of mistakes made elsewhere too, of course. Mm. Um, but so, so there'll be there's plenty of resentment. Um, but I think we've, I, you know, I think while it's very easy to say, I think we've got to be careful about overdoing the blame game here because what we really need to do is find out exactly what happened, who did what, uh, where, or didn't do what, where. So we don't make the mistakes again. You know, the uh, the the blame. There should be a sort of no blame, no shame, uh, open investigation. How real are, realistic that is is another question. Yeah, well, part, partly that may depend on the the kind of uh, response yeah. people like Donald Trump have. Um, you write that Kerry Packer taught you how to deal with billionaire bullies. Mm, well, uh, I think so he was probably the first one I got to know. Yeah. Would you have called him a friend? Yeah, I, I guess, yes, I suppose so. I mean, yes, we were friends up to a point. Yes, we were, um, but it was a professional relationship. Uh, and, you know, we, he was, Kerry was very, Kerry put enormous faith in me. I mean, it was, when, you, when I think about it, I mean, he hired me to do all of his legal work, to be his general counsel, responsible for all his legal work when I was 28. Now, when I was 28, it seemed to me a perfectly sensible decision on his part. But <laughs> looking back on it, I have to ask myself, if I was the possessor of a large media empire, you know, with very complex legal challenges and issues surrounding it all the time, would I put my fate in the hands of a bright 28-year-old? I don't know. But he did. And, you know, as it happened, it worked out well to yes. him because of the Costigan Commission. Yeah. On many occasions. When you got him cleared uh, mm. after the Costigan uh, inquiry, did you celebrate? Were there words exchanged? Was there a moment between you and Kerry Packer? Um, I don't think there was a... I don't, it wasn't a moment where he, you know, where the granite exterior cracked and he gave me a big hug uh uh i can't no i don't think it wasn't there wasn't a moment i mean it was a while coming i actually found the letter from the uh from the dpp the other day it's floating around here in my study was it in uh, with that model? They actually write and say we're not going to proceed to prosecute you so so it's quite a moment that was in um 80 that was in eight we didn't get that until 86 actually well maybe Frame that, put it near the bottle of vodka and uh, uh -huh. somewhere in Point Piper. Um, well, Kerry, Kerry was a teetotaler. He didn't drink. Yeah, but he loved to gamble. Yeah, ma massive, massive gambler. Just I've never seen anything like it and, and never understood it. You do share another uh, friend or, or, or colleague in, in Ita Buttrose who's now uh, the chair of the ABC. 
Yeah. Right choice? Yeah, great, great choice, I thought. A really inspired choice. I think she's uh, she's fantastic. Ida is, uh, I've known Ida for, oh, well, I would have met Ida first um, uh, in the uh, in the mid seventies, so you know how, how long is that? That's 40, over forty years ago. Mm. Extraordinary the connections and coincidences of your life, not just your life in, in tandem with Lucy's life. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the love, the enduring relationship of of you and Lucy a little bit later. But uh, let's just stay with well, uh, in the UK. How did Spycatcher change your life? Well, it was, okay, so Spycatcher, again, was one of those, look, I just, I'll just summarise quickly. So Peter Wright was an old MI5 agent who had retired, moved to Tasmania, and he decided to write his memoirs. Uh, and the British government were cross about that, and they got an injunction to stop him publishing it in the Australian courts, because that's where he lived. In Australia, and he, the his publisher Heinemann, and he were given advice from the top QCs and and top law firms, several of them, uh, that they could not win; that their case was literally hopeless, and they were going to just abandon the project. And their English solicitor was in Sydney watching the cricket. A mutual friend suggested he come and see me. Uh, I had just literally opened up our own law firm with Bruce McWilliam, uh, Turnbull McWilliam, uh, and we. I looked at it and I said, well, I think, I think we'll win. I think this is a winner. I think all these great men of the law, they were all men, uh, are wrong. And, uh, and uh, the client said, um, oh, well, you know, this is a bit wild. Uh, we don't have any money. And I said, well, I'll do the whole case for $20,000. Uh, and this is literally a year's work. <laughs> And uh, we had a little bit extra for the trial went for a few more weeks, but but we basically worked a whole year, Lucy and me, uh, for you know for very little money, and um, and we won the case. And it was such a big David v Goliath win that it sort of instantly made my reputation as an advocate, uh, not just in Australia but internationally, because it was huge news. It was bigger news in London than it was in Australia. And that really, that, that did change my life. It, you know, it put me, you know, I was, I, I was 32 at the time and it basically put me in the first league of the legal profession, uh, having won what was at that stage by far the biggest, most sensational trial uh, in Australia, certainly the most sensational trial with international interest in Australia at that time. Did that bring with it pressure? As well as prestige. Um, well, I mean, there was obviously a, lot, a hell of a lot of pressure when it's just me and Luce, and you know, she's a few years younger than me, so we were children basically compared to all these QCs and distinguished senior partners of big law firms and the British government. I mean, it was, it was literally, um, it was a David versus Goliath exercise. So there's plenty of pressure on us, uh, and with everybody saying, you know, that we wouldn't win, um, but but. But look, we, you know, we were young and confident and we just thought, we just went for it. It was actually, we, we had a great time. It was great. It was great, particularly when the kids came into court, uh, particularly when little Alex came in because he was then about, he was there in about four and um, he used to come in and, um, and watch what was happening. And he, those days he had a, um, he had one of his toys was a sort of a, someone had given him a, a black plastic English policeman's helmet, um, which which he always insisted on wearing when he went to court, which of course was <laughs> all of the English journalists and lawyers thought was incredibly funny. So it was, it was sweet, you know. My, it was good. It was a it was a very it was an absolute team effort. And you know the I mean, for the benefit of the lawyers, if you read the judgment of the High Court, it's a very it's quite a short one. We won there seven nil, and it's decided on one fairly arcane point of law about enforcing a foreign public law in Australia. Uh, and that argument was prepared, researched and written by Lucy. So it was Lucy's argument that actually uh, won the day. I mean, all of the colourful, sensational evidence, of course, was very important at the trial. Uh, I was I was dealing with that. But, uh, 
Lucy's intellect carried the day in the High Court. Claire's just made a comment saying they should make a movie of the spy catcher case. So, um, you know, if you've got any script writing capabilities, Malcolm. Well, you know, Bob Ellis and Stephen Ramsey actually wrote a script for it years ago. But um, Bob, Bob, of course, is no longer with us. But uh, so there is, there is, there is actually is a script floating around, at least one. All right. Well, you had. Um incredible uh, success in uh, in law and in investment banking. When did you decide that you wanted to be the Prime Minister of Australia? Um, look, I always, I, I always had an idea of going into politics. That was always an interest of mine, even when I was a kid. Um, I don't know that I had a, you know, a ferocious determination to be Prime Minister as such, um, but I was interested in politics. I ran uh, for Liberal pre-selection for Wentworth not long after we got back from Oxford in 80, uh, would have been 81, and, and, and very nearly won, as I describe in the book, very nearly won the pre-selection, much to Lucy's horror, because we'd only just got married and we were planning on a family and she she wasn't very keen on, you know, having a husband in Canberra and small children in Sydney, but the, um, uh, and then, you know, then I stayed politically involved one way or another over the years in different ways and then finally ran for parliament and uh, got elected in 04 when I was 50 and, of course, by which stage our kids were grown up. So that was quite a good age to go into parliament, I think, from a family point of view. Tell me one quality from your mother and one quality from your father that through your life have shaped your response to the kind of pressure you've been under in various fields? Well, from my father, uh, I would say uh, determination. Um, you know, he always used to say, never take a backward step, uh, which, you know, you can, you can overdo that, of course, but, but uh, I've always been, uh, I've always been very, you know, when I take, I, I'm not someone that backs down or gets pushed around easily. So very, so strong and, and you know, strong convictions. Uh, from my mother, I think what I most inherited was a love of words and of literature and books and writing. She, you know, she was a, an actress, uh, a writer, a script writer at the radio initially, a novelist, a historian, you know, English professor. So her Coral's world was the world of books and libraries. Mm. Father's world was a much more physical world of beaches and surfing and horses and running and you know all of that stuff. He was a very outdoors guy and very fit. Do you still, um, when you think of him, talk to him? Uh, I think of him all the time, uh, and I, yeah, I don't, I don't talk to him. Uh, I had, I used to dream of when, but not for the, you know, maybe. 10 years after he was killed, I used to have the most vivid dreams of him at, at being with him. And I would, I would wake up and I, I honestly, for a, for a, you know, a minute or two, I wasn't, I was, I was uncertain as to whether it was a dream or whether it was real, you know, you know, one of the, some of those very real dreams, mm. but I haven't, I haven't had that experience in recent times, but I think about him a lot. Uh, and I think about what he would have thought and what he would have said. Uh, and it's amazing, amazing how many little things I learnt from him. And, you know, yeah, just, I mean, could you see, because my mother left us, when, you know, when she, when she she left in a sort of, it's it very hard to put, she was definitely gone by the time I was 10, but she really left by the time I was nine because Dad was trying to persuade me that she hadn't really left. She was just away for a little while and it was, you know, he, he went to great lengths to, ensure that I didn't uh, resent her departure. Um, but anyway, the good thing was two, you know, two guys, father and son living together in a flat, he, he, he taught me a lot of good basic domestic skills, you know. So, you know, he taught me how to, you know, how to wash, how to iron, um, you know, how to cook, very limited, very limited repertoire, as Lucy would assure you. Um, and, uh, <laughs> together and I mean I think um, one thing that will 
maybe surprise people when uh, they read your memoir is the way that you describe yourself as a small child. Um, you know, sort of this, this pigeon-toed kid with asthma. Yeah, I was very sickly, actually, yeah, very sickly. You, you, you went to boarding school and you hated it, you used to wet the bed there. Mm, yeah, no, I was very, I was, I was terribly unhappy there. I mean, I think it was because, you know, my parents, the marriage was, was. Uh, I mean, I went to boarding school when I was eight in, you know, the beginning of 1963, and my parents were were already, you know, they were they were living in the same flat, but they weren't sleeping in the same bedroom. And you know, Dad was sleeping in a little sort of, you know, room, tiny little room, you know, the single bed at the back of the flat. And um, uh, so, you know, I think all of that, looking back, all of that must have fed into my thinking. And you know, I still have letters from from Dad's papers with, you know, with the headmaster writing to my father and saying, look, you know, this kid really should not be at boarding school. He's so unhappy, you know, you should have him at home. Uh, but the problem was Coral was leaving and coming and going and then going. Mm. And my dad was, uh, Bruce was a hotel broker and he was travelling a lot, you know, in those days. A hotel broker, you know, is like a real estate agent for pubs. And uh, he was often, often in the country, you know, I mean, I used to go in school holidays. I used to go with him. I remember doing the, um, you know, stock takes, you know, counting drip trays and stenrites and um, glasses and <laughs> dropping them, dropping a tray of glasses. All the more, you know, interesting exercise in um, the psychology of, of Malcolm Turnbull. That that start, um, your mother leaving very young, mm. losing your father young. Um, you know, the, the period of history that you've just been through politically, you write a bit about trust and who you rely on and that you still trusted people that, um, in fact, let me just read, there's a there's a section that I kind of had to stop and read again on trust that says... Um, what page is that? Page 438. Okay. It's 700 pages. Yeah, um, very good value. <laughs> this stood out to me on trust. Corman and Dutton told me not to trust Julie and George. Julie, George and Christopher told me not to trust Corman and Dutton. Barnaby told me not to trust any of them and everybody told me not to trust Morrison. I trusted them all, some more warily than others. Yep, that's right. That's exactly what it, that's, that's... You also write, oh. you also write, I'm not a hater. I'm just not a hater. Yeah. Um, and look, people will have their views on it, you know, some of the political elements of their book and, you know, your version versus what other people say is, is their recollection of events. But I guess what I'm circling back to is that learning more about your, your younger life and some of the challenges there, Yeah, it's interesting that you seem to have uh, uh, emerged as an optimist who trusts people. Yeah. When you had a mother leave you so young, and in fact, in in professional life, you say that people uh, were audaciously duplicitous, duplicitous. I think is the term you use, Morrison. Well, that's that that regrettably is what politics and politicians are mostly like. Uh, it is a it, it it's a very it's very you know it's it's very much worse than the business world. Believe me, um, it's a very uh, it is, you talked about dystopian earlier in the talking about Trump's view of the world. There's a dystopian sort of uh, sense about uh, politics too. It's a very, it's a very ruthless, uh, 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 you know, environment where many people feel their only way to advance is over the body of somebody else. Uh, and it's, um, and, you know, the, 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 there's a sort of ecosystem a very destructive ecosystem with the uh, with the press, um, where the as Luce always used to say, the journalists are like the hounds and the politicians are like the foxes, and the the you know the the the, the journalists want to tear the politicians to bits, and of course the politicians are trying to tear themselves to bits as well. But it is a you know there's a 
there, there's a brutality about it, Rebecca. I mean, it's, look, it's not, it's not ugly. It's just, it's not, it's not, it's very ugly. And I mean, I have to say, I do not miss the politics one bit. I mean, I miss the office of prime minister. I miss the opportunity to do good things for Australia. I miss the opportunity to, you know, reform the tax system, you know, to negotiate trade deals internationally, build big bits of infrastructure. I love all of that. I love all the positive things, you know, promoting innovation and science. Uh, but all of the backstabbing and, and that, all of those people, honestly, it's just, it, it's, it, that's, that's the hard bit. And, you know, the weird thing is there are some people in politics that actually that's what they love. They love the game. They love the game of politics. For me, it was always just a means to an end, you know, and that's why I've always said I think power without purpose is pointless. Um, I just realised it is it uh, is we're half an hour in and, of course, I still have loads of questions for you, but we are going to go to some um, uh, listener or viewer questions. I'm not sure what the stream mm. questions in a moment. Um, so if you want to throw some questions up, we'll, we'll put them directly to... Uh, Malcolm, um, have you still got any friends in politics? Who's your mate in politics? Well, I never, I, I didn't have many uh, ever, and I haven't. I certainly didn't. I did never. Haven't lost any of the ones I had, uh, but I didn't have many. You, you don't make many friends in politics. Um, the relationships are largely transactional, mm. uh, and. You know, I thought Matthias Cormann was a friend, frankly, and he turned out to be uh, both weak and treacherous. So that was a big disappointment. Um, I, you know, Julie, Julie Bishop and Christopher are both friends, and you know, George is a George Brandis is a is a friend, but they were friends before I got into politics. To be frank, should you be kicked out of the Liberal Party? Well, certainly not. What for? Why would I be kicked out of the Liberal Party? With the party of free speech? It's, expel someone for writing a book, it would seem a bit odd. You also write in the book uh, that Josh Frydenberg wears his ambition and his prime ministerial destiny on his sleeve. Yep, that's right. He, do, he does. And I say it's, uh, you know, unlike many people, his ambition is matched by ability. No, Josh, is, J J Josh has nothing to complain about in this book, I can tell you. Do you think Josh Frydenberg will be the prime minister? Well, he, he could be. Uh, I mean, I could make a prediction that he will be and that would presumably be the kiss of death but the uh but i no look he's a he is a he he's got a, he's got all the you know he's got everything going for him he's uh he's uh, prodigiously hard working i mean the thing about josh is that he is a very very hard working person you know there are a lot of people in politics who uh, basically feel it's just a marketing exercise and skim across the surface, never want to get into the, you know, detail. They get a few talking points and that's all they want to know. Um, you know, others like me, and I wasn't really a professional politician in the sense that other people had been in it all their lives were, but, you know, I always wanted to know about every, everything I was talking about. So I was keen on getting to the facts. Josh is extremely energetic, hardworking, gets into the detail, uh, and he's very personable, you know. So, I mean, I, I look, who knows? I mean, you never know uh, mm. what is going to happen, but he's got all the, he has all the uh, the elements that you would need. He ticks all the boxes, put it that way. Okay. Uh, there are some questions coming in for you. Mm. So we'll try and whip through a couple of those. Are you pouring vodka? Is that what, vodka you no, pouring? no, I'm having, I'm having a glass of white wine because it is, after all, 8.30 on Friday night. I mean, okay. The Chardonnay swilling. Uh, the, 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 the Russian vodka bottle is still, where is it? Uh, it's still, the, the cap is still <laughs> uh, on it. Yeah. Um, I can see a few questions coming through from, from people, including a young guy called Hugo Hickey. Remember that name? He might be in politics one day. I'm interested to see him on there tonight. But Claire says, uh, Malcolm, do you think Australia has room for a major third party to emerge? Uh, well, yes, I think it does. Um, you know, we've got, we have uh, compulsory voting, we've got preferential voting. Um, yeah, I think a third, I mean, a, if you've got first past the post voting, like in the UK, for example, uh, and, and so you don't have preferences, uh, third parties, 
find it very hard, you know, as is with the, you know, the UK Liberal Lib Dems in the UK. But here, a third party, uh, yes, it definitely, uh, definitely could emerge. Historically, they've struggled, but you know, I would say the environment is 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 it does doesn't restrict doesn't uh, preclude them. Put it that way. Yeah. Uh, while you've mentioned environment, Reid says, Malcolm, how would you like to contribute to helping science and climate policy uh, to help look after the Great Barrier Reef? Well, I mean, the most the, the most important thing, Mari, that we need to do is. Um, address global warming. I mean, the biggest threat there are there are many threats to the reef, right? And the um, the biggest single threat is uh, global warming. You know, hotter sea, you know, the sea temperatures rising that creates bleaching, and you know, you all, we all understand that. So that's well, that, that's the point. Not everyone understands that, and a, and a good yeah. people in the Liberal Party oh, don't. No. No, no, they just deny it. But they're, they're, the, they're the people who deny it. But they just say it's not real, it's not happening. Well, it is happening. I mean, how did you, how did you, denying climate change is like denying gravity, you know? How did you navigate those conversations, though, within your own party? It was, it's very difficult. I mean, and this is, uh, it's not easy. You, you, uh, you have to, it's extremely complicated. I mean, climate change, the problem has become, uh, that in the Liberal Party, particularly in the LNP in Queensland, I might say, uh, the climate change has become an issue of belief. Uh, it's become a values issue, where in fact it's simply a question of physics. But let me just go back to Murray and just answer the second part of the question. The second part of looking after the health of the reef, uh, which is what you know my government put a lot of money into, is uh, addressing runoff, uh, so you don't get so many um, you know, so much fertiliser and nutrients running off into the reef. Uh, so there's a lot of programs to, you know, uh, stop runoff off agricultural land in particular. Uh, and also there's a lot of money going into programs to develop more resilient species of coral that will be able to cope with warmer temperatures. So, uh, but, the, you know, you've got a whole lot of, of localised challenges which you can address, I mean, they're not easy, but then you've got the mega challenge of global warming and that, that requires global action. Hugo's question was, if you could do it all again, what would you do differently? Um, that's, a good, that's a good question, Hugo. I'm not... Um, oh, this, look, there's too many... Read the book. There's too many things I would do. I, give me one. I've made, I've made plenty of. I've made give me something plenty. that's turned over and over in your mind. In oh, the, in I'm the, not. You know, I don't. I don't do that. That's one of the reasons. I mean, I went through a very bad, depressive episode in 2010 that I write about—a very black period. But generally, I don't. I'm not a backward-looking person. You know, I don't sort of go back over the past and say, "Oh, what? You know, I should have done this or I should have done that." Because honestly, that that way madness lies. You know, my wife Lucy has always said to me, um, and she's very sensible on all things, but particularly on this, she says you can't live your life backwards, and that's that's right. Anna says, "Do you support more Australian manufacturing?" Well, I yeah, I mean yes. Who 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 wouldn't? But I mean, it depends if it's you know on on what terms and. Uh, I think it's, I, I, I'll let me say to you, I'll, I'll tell you where, where I think we could do more manufacturing. Um, the, our, the opportunities are in what you'd call advanced manufacturing. So the more, um, you know, um, at, well, advanced high tech uh, opportunities uh, there are, uh, particularly where the labour input, you know, the labour cost is a small part of the overall cost because obviously we're a high wage economy. So we're never going to be a cost-effective, cost-competitive place to make sand shoes or t-shirts, right? Uh, but um, you know, uh, uh, precision engineering equipment, yes. Uh, some you know scientific equipment uh, areas uh, with agricultural science. Um, there are some great Australian companies um, in the um, 
uh, you know, advanced, well, advanced navigation is one com company that doing phenomenal work in inertial navigation systems that actually I'm, this is public, I'm, you know, I'm an investor in. Uh, they've got a world's best product, uh, satellite, some satellite companies. So there's, there's a lot more happening in Australian manufacturing than you'd think. But I don't, you know, I don't think we'll ever go back to making, you know, textiles on a large scale or, um, you know, or, uh, you know, shoes and sand shoes and that kind of thing. But I mean, this, this curtain behind me, by the way, this is a one. This is Australian design. Australian designs. This is done by in Australia by a company called Utopia Designs, and that's a you know that that's an Australian design company that is obviously bringing particular Australian expertise and motifs to um, you know that 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 part of the industry. Yeah, Matt says, Malcolm, would you stop Adani? Uh, I don't look. You know, I. The, the, the real question is, you're really saying, if I was Prime Minister, would I take federal action to stop Adani? I think it's actually quite hard to do that legally. Mm. Uh, what I find baffling about Adani is that it's happening at all. I do not understand the economics of it. I mean, I really don't. I don't see um, how it stacks up economically, which is the thing that's always baffled me and that worries me about it as to whether... Uh, this is really a commercially viable proposal. But, you know, the one thing that is very clear is that we have got to find a way to stop as quickly as we can to not just stop digging coal out of the ground but stop burning it. I mean, the sooner we can stop burning coal, uh, the sooner we'll get we, being the whole world, will start to get our greenhouse gas emissions down. But it's, you know, it's not a... It, it's a... It is a... Um, it, it's... It's quite a complex uh, thing from a le from a legal point of view, uh, and you know, and, and people, they've got their legal rights. But I, I, I just do not understand how how it possibly can be commercial. That's my that's my view as an old um, businessman. Um, just while we're on current issues, Adrian says, if you were still here, how would you deal with Virgin? Well. We need a we we do need a competitive airline to Qantas. Uh, I don't think the government should be you know bailing out shareholders or indeed debt holders. The important thing is that a you know that there is a competitive airline emerges from that, and that will probably that 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 will. I don't know how involved the government really needs to be with that. I suspect uh, not as much as people think. Uh, I think what will happen. Uh, is that the shareholders will lose their money, as it often happens. The debt holders will end up losing a bit of their money and they may turn some of their debt into equity and they may need some new, some new uh, money. I, I, again, I'm not close enough to the details. I mean, I used to do this kind of thing for a living. Yeah. And so I know I'm too familiar with this sort of restructuring to talk about it without having all the facts. But the, yeah. one, the one end point... Is you know, do we want to have a Qantas monopoly in domestic aviation? The answer to that is absolutely not. So, so I hope Virgin survives, but we've got to make a distinction between Virgin, the business, and Virgin its employees on the one hand, and the investors who you know are all grown ups and uh, you know aren't really deserving of uh, of subsidies and bailouts as investors. Okay, um, I'm conscious of. Of time, and I do want to finish up with just a, a couple of quick questions on Lucy. But I just one question. So many questions flying up the screen. Josh, I saw say something along the lines of, given all of the leadership shuffles, the difficulty in uh, um, you know setting in place long term policy. Uh, I think the question was along the lines of, uh, how do you fix the system? You know that you you've talked you write a lot in the book about the influence of news corporation and various other challenges. What, are, what is the solution you see, Malcolm Turnbull, to some of those challenges? Well, I think that, um, I think it was a great mistake back in the 80s when Paul Keating allowed News Corp to buy the Herald and Weekly Times group and it basically gave them 70% of Australia's newspapers, if not more, including, you know, almost all the news, daily newspapers in Queensland, including the Courier Mail in, in Brisbane, where you are. Uh, that, was a, that was a big, that was a Labor decision, by the way, not a, it wasn't the 
the uh, wicked liberals that did that. Um, that was a massive mistake. Um, the media scene has has been completely transformed. You know, the mainstream media is their business model has been smashed. You know, businesses, papers that were worth you know hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, are being closed. Um, and you know, even mainstream, you know, even uh, free to air televisions business model is being is really under siege. And there, but nonetheless, the the problem, what's really the real problem with News Corp, is that it no longer operates like a news organisation. You know, it's um, it's become much more like a political organisation that employs a lot of journalists. And so it doesn't hold government to account in the way that journalists do. It holds governments to account if they want to get rid of the government and protects them if they don't. Uh, and their active involvement in the coup against me in 2018, well, I mean, you only had to look at what they were saying in the newspapers to recognise that. But Rupert Murdoch, there's a discussion with him in the book in which he, you know, concedes that uh, their senior editorial executive in Australia was seeking to uh, bring the government down so that we'd lose an election and Abbott would come back in opposition afterwards. You know, I mean, just crazy stuff. So, uh, you know, there's a... The, how do you fix that? Um, I guess the... The, it's it, it's it's challenging. The difficult there's a Queensland politician called Ted O'Brien that many of you your listeners would your viewers would know, Beck, who um, who's the member for Fairfax, and he's a basically a pretty progressive guy. He's a Republican. You know, I, I would say he's in reality a smaller liberal, although he probably doesn't can't say that too loudly with the LNP. But he said to me that he had to support Dutton, even though I didn't think he had much in common with Dutton because his branch members were having a daily a, a branch meeting every night with Peter Credlin and Alan Jones. So you see that right-wing media group, that they are very influential with the members of the LNP in particular and, and, and you know, members of the Liberal Party. So they may not have a huge audience nationally, but they're very independent uh, sectionally. Um, it's a look, it's a, it, it's, it doesn't. It's a. It's a. It become. It's a real. It is a real issue. I mean, you've got Kerry Stokes talking about the way Murdoch was uh, moving against me, and uh, you know. So it's elegant. It's. It's. This is some of the facts in this book. Read like a. Uh, read like a political thriller. Um, I'm um, I, 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 I wish that were fiction, but the, sadly, the, sadly, it happened. Well. Some of those mentioned uh, challenge that concept, but hey, this is your virtual. They don't, they don't you know. It's it's quite interesting. They don't really. They sort of what they you know go. They sort of say, "Oh, my recollections differ." But if you look at the recollections I write about in this book, they're almost invariably documented. Yeah. Well, actually, you know those throughout the book. You have loads of diary entries. Exactly. Handwritten entries, or did do you do you type? No, no my hand my, my handwriting is so bad. Uh, I struggle to read it, let alone anyone else. So no, I just no, I, I used to just not not every night, but you yeah. know, very often I would just keep a note of what happened and interesting discussions, and it's a you know phenomenal resource because uh, mm. because it's so easy to forget things otherwise. Yes. Um, just one more question on politics before I promise we're going to finish with Lucy and love. Yeah. Um, billionaire plutocrats, you say, didn't own you. Yeah. Do you think they own Scott Morrison? Well, I, I, I own is, pro, is too strong a word, but uh, the relationship between Morrison and News Corp is much more like the relationship between Abbott and News Corp. In the sense, and, and I mean, Scott jokes about this. You know how he, he. Uh, I mean, you look at the relationship between Dutton and the Courier Mail. You look at the relationship between Morrison and Simon Benson at the Australian. Uh, you know, and and the shock shocks on um, on Sky. You know, they have a privileged relationship with the government. Uh, they get dropped. You know, they get information from the government. They get privileged access, and in return for that, they give good reviews and. Uh, don't hold the government to account. Now, I, I have dealt with very, very wealthy people for much of my life. Um, 
and in my experience, uh, billionaires or plutocrats, depending on how you want to describe them, they like politicians they can control or own in some way or another. And they, they all knew me, they've known me for many of them for decades and decades, and that I know that I'm, you know, I'm not able to be owned or controlled by anybody. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, I always think that's what they, they objected to. So the, that's the, that I regret to say is reality. Power is a, is a um, very seductive thing. And people with money like to feel they can buy anything. They can buy yachts and planes and big houses and they like to uh, own people as well. Do you still have a, a relationship with Scott Morrison? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, from time to time, yeah. I mean, I I give him, uh, pass on to him my, um, you know, advice from time to time. I helped them out on something the other day that was had a bit of a problem with something that uh, where I was able to help. But, I, you look, I don't think he, he, he doesn't, um, he's pretty confident of his own abilities. Maybe you don't need so many friends in some of those areas because of the enduring strength of your relationship with Lucy. She is present throughout uh, the book from literally the moment you met her, you recall the first bunch of flowers you sent her, the first date that you went on at uh, Circu Circular Key, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Well, it was, a, it was the... Lucy, I wasn't sure if I asked Lucy out whether she'd come out. She was she was nineteen, and I was I was just I was nervous about asking her out by herself. So the only married couple I knew that were even vaguely my age uh, happened to be Bob Carr and uh, Helena Carr, because Bob was Bob had got a job at the Bulletin, which I'd helped him get, and so he's older than me, but you know only a few years older than me, and so. Um, we had our four day. It was a sort of a, a four, you know, the four of us. Um, double date. A double date. Well, it was. It sort of sounded safer saying, "Oh, you know, would you like to come to dinner with uh, my friends? You know, married friends, Bob and Helena Carr." Sounds very safe, don't you think? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you mentioned that really. Uh, that period of darkness that you went through, which I think, and I can see in some of the comments two people are responding to, um, you know, I guess you revealing some of that vulnerability, the, the challenges of mental health and you becoming aware of your own mental health. Was Lucy aware of... of oh, gender totally. Well, she was the only person that really knew everything um, that was going on. Uh, but she obviously, well, she's, you know, She's living with, I don't have, you know, you can't conceal, you, even if you wanted to, you couldn't conceal that from your, well, I couldn't conceal that from Lucy. My, you know, heart is an open book uh, to her. And um, she, and, you know, and she was, she was very worried naturally. And, but her, she responded with a lot of love. And that was, that's really what you need. Mm. Yeah, what, else, you know, what else got you through that depression? Um, uh, I think love from Lucy and my family. Uh, I had I had some good advice from uh, from some doctors, from my doctors. I only had two two people were helping me at the time, um, and uh, some of which I you know, I didn't take all of the advice. I might say, but the but it was it was good to talk to them, uh, and I guess determination. I just when I realised when it really dawned on me how sick I was. I resolved that I was going to get better. And so I weaned myself off the antidepressants I was taking. And I just, it was like, you know, it was like clawing out of a very deep pit, you know, with your fingernails. And I just kept on clawing and clawing and clawing. And I, you know, I, I stayed in Parliament. I threw myself back into my job. I focused on that and just and I and I just stopped thinking about the past. And that was a very, one of the most important things I did was that I did not bear any enmity or negativity towards the people that had been involved in overthrowing my leadership. 
including people like Andrew Rock, who behaved in an incredibly uh, treacherous way. You know, I mean, like it was, you know, Ian McFarlane, you know, another Queenslander, said it was the most treacherous thing he'd ever seen in all his years in Parliament. But I just decided I was going to just drive all that hatred, or not, I didn't have it, but I was going to drive any negativity, let alone hatred, out of me and just focus on the future and positivity, and that was very important. And so you ended up becoming Australia's 29th Prime Minister. Malcolm Turnbull, I can see lots of people. Grace saying, great discussion. Also bought several copies, one for my 90-year-old dad. Terry's just received a copy of uh, your book for her birthday and lots of people very interested to see where life takes you next. So who knows, maybe there's another book at some point. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, it's a, they're, they're great. the books are great when you finish writing them. I find they're great. They're great when you start, and then when you get about halfway through, you say, "Why did I start this? <laughs> I'll never finish it." Um, well, Richard Feidler, I worked for a long time with Richard Feidler, and um, we'd often a book this size to to illustrate the the sort of the, the heft of it. Richard Feidler loves to drop yeah. the book on the table. So your yours is a, a book drop dropper, and in, in Richard Feidler, yeah. I can yeah. guarantee you that. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Anyway, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm, uh, yep, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad I've written it. It's, uh, it's been a great experience. There's a lot of very, there's a look, there's a, there's pol a lot of politics in it. There's a lot of personal things in it. There's a lot of funny stories in it. Um, do we have time for one? I do. Oh, good. I, do. I don't know. I don't know. Well, there's, yeah. like, you know, like the funniest story. I mean, the funniest moment. I think when I was prime minister, and there are quite a lot because I, I I'm easily amused. You know, I I I, uh, off, I see the funny side of things quite a lot, but it was um, literally uh, two years ago, uh, almost to the day. It was Anzac Day in, in 2018 in France at Villas Breton, there, the wonderful sort of Art Deco uh, Australian m m monument, you know, memorial there. Uh, uh, which was, um, you know, built, was, you know, opened, completed in the 30s after the First World War. And the dawn service was held. It was freezing cold, you know, and like everyone was there. The French Prime Minister was there. Prince Charles was there. All of our senior military people and a lot of ministers were there. And, um, and it was freezing cold. It was raining. And um, at the moment, the last post has been played and the... Uh, now the Ravalli's played and the time has come for the flags to go up. And on this side, sorry, on, on this side of the uh, order of the, you know, big area, uh, there is the Australian flag on a flagpole and there's a sailor standing there with the lanyards. And on the other side, there's a French soldier and he's there with the French flag and it's half mast. And their job is now to pull the flags up very slowly and we're watching this everyone's freezing cold and I get a little jab from my ribs from Lucy and she says our flag's going down and I looked and it was he was pulling it the flag in the wrong way and I thought oh well there'll be a warrant officer or a chief petty officer or someone will emerge and you know tap him on the shoulder and fix it up but no it kept going down and no, I looked around, no one seemed to notice it. So I thought, well, we can't have this going on. So I literally got up, walked up, and said to the sailor, our flag's meant to be going up. Whereupon, I have to say, in the finest traditions of the Royal Australian Navy, he uttered some very pithy remarks of a colourful kind, <laughs> and our flag then reversed direction <laughs> and shot to the top of the flagpole, overtaking the French flag. Um, and it was, very, it was very sweet. So I came back. No one seemed to notice this happening except for Prince Charles, who just leaned over and said, very decisive action, Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, I thought it was just, I thought it was just a little bit of, in that most solemn moment, just a little touch of, of you know, faint absurdity in, uh, in that, at that time. And uh, I love, I might, that's, anyway, I, I take a, I always, find funny things to record. We had some, a lot of funny, there's a lot, quite a few funny moments in politics in here too. It's not all 
grim. I mean, everyone focuses on that coup and everything, but we had a lot of, uh, there were a lot of funny times, particularly with Julie and Christopher Pine, who are very, Pine, of course, is, is, a, is a sort of like a walking, you know, vaudeville act all, all by himself. It has been a delight to share this time with you, and I don't think we've uh, we spent too much time in the weeds of that negativity. But people will uh, enjoy reading your reflections on politics, and and again, I think there is a real sense of like, what can we learn from former prime ministers on all sides? And you've given people lots of food for thought in uh, in this memoir. Thank you, Malcolm Turnbull. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Everyone wants you to crack the bottle of vodka, by the way. I just yeah, I, I know everyone, but you know, I, I've got it. I mean, who knows? Like, it's so old. I think it's, I think I should just leave it as a memento. Isn't he a scary looking guy? Yeah, just hold it up a bit closer. Yeah, Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Other way, other way. No, other yeah. Yeah. Oh, that way. Yeah, he yeah. said, um, he said to me, um, yeah, he was very interesting. He said to me at one point, he said, uh, he spoke, his English had reasonable English, and he said, uh, I am only seeing you because after careful research, I have concluded that Australia is not a geopolitical threat to Russia. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm really glad you've worked that one out. That's That must have been a big anxiety. Had, you know, it, was <laughs> wild, it was a wild place, Russia, and I had uh, a lot of, uh, well, I had some fun but uh, also some scary moments both in Moscow and in Siberia. Oh, I kind of want to keep asking you questions. But yeah, there's a few of those stories in the book. Good. All right. Malcolm Turnbull, thank you very much for having us all at, at uh, Point Piper this evening. Thank you. Yes, in the dreaded Harborside Mansion made famous by uh, Peter Kretlin. And oh, so this is it. This is the one. So, so many of my admirers on uh, in, uh, in the media, yeah. <laughs> well, it's nice to see it at okay. long run. All right. Okay, thank you so much. And thank good, you. Night. good night to everyone. And if you buy the book, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Bye.